Hi there, I'm Hallie. And as we come on the air, we are learning new details about this hostage crisis in the war between Israel and Hamas as you're taking a live look tonight at Gaza on the ground. Dramatic rescue efforts happening all across the country to get victims of this war back to their loved ones. So that is body cam video released by Israeli police. They say it's of officers on a rescue mission for hostages in southern Israel. This video was blurred before being distributed. NBC News cannot independently confirm the events shown, but it gives you a sense of what is happening tonight as we speak on the ground. President Biden now confirming that 20 Americans are among those missing. 14 Americans are dead after what the president is calling an attack of sheer evil. This is terrorism. But sadly, for the Jewish people, it's not new. Secretary of State Tony Blinken headed to Israel tomorrow. All of it coming amid growing pressure and desperation for help from families who haven't heard from loved ones in days. We're on the call with her as the terrorist barged into her home. And we heard a little bit of screaming. They were throwing grenades in, shooting machine guns, and we know that Hirsch's arm from the elbow down was um, severed. The last time uh, that we heard from him was uh, Saturday morning, where he uh, said that they were under attack. In just the three days since this war started, more than a thousand people have been killed in Israel, according to that embassy. Health ministries in Gaza and the West Bank say at least 830 people have been killed there. You heard their sirens and explosions tonight in the coastal city of Ashkelon, with strikes like those hitting neighborhoods across the region, lining streets like this one with bodies at a scale officials say they have never seen before. In Gaza, emergency responders rushing hurt children covered in debris and blood, images that illustrate the grim and terrible cost of war, images that are disturbing, including the video that we're about to show you. It is hard to watch. It is absolutely disturbing. It is also the reality of what people are living through right now. The video here showing Israeli hostages taken by Hamas over the weekend. And new images coming into us now show those same people now dead. We blurred the bodies in the picture, but these are people's family members. This is the horror, the nightmare that they're living. And tonight, the pressure is on Gaza's borders, both with Israel and with Egypt. There's concern about the potential for a mass exodus from the Gaza Strip through what's known as the Rafah border crossing into Egypt. Right to show you some of the crowds there, you see this, people arriving with their families, with their suitcases. It is a multi-pronged story. There are many angles to cover. I want to bring in Ali Velshi, who is live for us in Ashdod. Raf Sanchez is in Ashkelon in Israel. Monica Alba has the latest from the White House. Ali, let me start with you. Talk us through what you're seeing on the ground and two major fronts from the military perspective here on the part of the Israelis. There's now word that from the IDF that Syria has started, or at least the strikes have come from across the Syrian border with this anticipation here for at some point the potential for a full on ground attack by Israel. The question is, do they cross into Gaza and when? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on right now. By the way, uh, RAF is right behind me in, in Ashkelon, and moments ago we just saw another airstrike on Gaza, which is just beyond where RAF is. You may see that over my, uh, over my shoulder as we're talking. There are airstrikes underway in Gaza right now. Now, on the, on the Syrians, on the Lebanese side of things and the Syrian side of things, there's activity in, on both fronts, and we have seen uh, activity across both fronts. Uh, both are... Iran. There we go. We got another explosion in Gaza right over there. There are fighter jets, by the way, going by us. That's where they're coming from. Uh, both are, are influenced by Iran. Hezbollah in Lebanon. We've seen activity there in the last few days. And Syria, of course, uh, is, a, is a city, a country that is essentially dominated by Iran and Russia right now. The Syrian government is not operational on its own. So uh, Israel is very worried about this. They've called up now 360,000 reserves. As of yesterday, you and I talked, it was 300,000. 
another 60,000, and they're sending planes uh, from various places to bring those reservists back because they don't have enough. There's more activity even on the West Bank, and Israel's been putting reserves into the West Bank for the last 10 months or so. So Israel is very concerned about the possibility of war on three fronts. On the north, Syria and Lebanon, uh, the Golan Heights saw activity again today from Syria. That's what you're referring to. Uh, the Golan Heights is disputed territory. It is Syrian territory. Uh, Israel has annexed it, so they control it as, as uh, land that is not recognized as theirs. The West Bank has seen more activity in terms of attacks at border crossings, uh, at, at checkpoints, and now in Gaza. The issue from uh, Israelis we've been talking to who have family who are hostages uh, of, of Hamas is they want those hostages freed separately and independently from the goal of decapitating Hamas leadership. Those are two separate goals. Mm. Hamas can possibly be defeated by Israel. That's a longer term issue. These families want their hostages back and there are only two ways to do that. They can either negotiate with somebody who talks to Hamas like Qatar or we don't have any relations with Iran so that's not possible or there's some kind of a rescue mission that's going to have to go underway. But Gaza is a very densely populated yeah. uh, built, uh, city full of buildings, and that's going to be the problem. Going in there is a different kind of warfare than bombing from the sky. And we're going to talk about that in just a couple of minutes, Ali. You mentioned this, obviously, hostage crisis that is sort of top of mind for so many people right now. We showed some of the video from Israeli officials describing what they say is this operation to try to get some of these hostages out. Talk about what that push looks like here, where that goes next. Well, you know, they, Israel has now said that it has secured the border around uh, Gaza. However, they, they also believe that there are uh, uh, Hamas activists in Israel. So there's still some fighting going around, uh, going on in the places around the border. That said, the hostages, they believe, are inside Gaza and they don't know where they are. Israel has full visibility over Gaza. It has typically drones flying over Gaza. It can see everything that you can see from the sky all the time. It doesn't know what happens inside those buildings or in the basements of those buildings. It doesn't know whether those hostages are going to be human shields. By the way, Israel feels that it has uh, identified all of the hostages who are there. It's not for sure, but they think they know who they all are, and they've started informing the families of that. Ali? Ali Velshi, who is live for us there. Uh, Ali, thank you so much for your coverage there on the ground. We'll be checking back in with you, I know, later on this hour. Appreciate it. In just the last couple of hours, we've heard from President Biden laying out what the U.S. is doing now to help one of our closest allies, starting with replenishing key ammunition and interceptors for the Iron Dome air defense system, sending a team of technical experts to try to help coordinate the logistics of rescuing some of these hostages and moving military apparatus more cl close to the region, essentially closer to the region, the Gerald Ford aircraft carrier, several destroyers, fighter jets as well, as the president in a forceful and emotional speech laying out in clear terms how he views this. You know, there are moments in this life, and I mean this literally, when the pure, unadulterated evil is unleashed on this world. The people of Israel lived through one such moment this weekend. I want to bring in NBC's Monica Alba, who is live for us near the White House. As Monica, we are showing here this statement from Hamas just into us in the last couple of minutes ago, responding to the president's speech, the speech in which the president made very clear the full-throated support that the U.S. has for Israel. Let me bring that up again, because Hamas is laying into what they described as the fallacies in what the president had to say. Not surprising there, as the president has gone after them as a terrorist organization. The key is what happens now vis-a-vis um, -vis the U.S. to Israel. Talk us through it with confirmation now that Americans are among those being held by Hamas. Yeah, that was a really big headline that came out of the president's remarks earlier today, Hallie. And we don't know how many of them there are. That remains a big question. We know 14 Americans have been killed, and officials really expect that number could rise. And so that just really shows you the fluidity of the entire situation. And in terms of that number of how many are unaccounted for, we're looking at around 20, which we also heard a little bit more information about from National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan in the briefing. Here's a little bit of that. We believe that there are 20 or more Americans who at this point are missing, but I want to underscore and stress that does not mean necessarily that there are 20 or more American hostages. Just that is the number who are currently unaccounted for. 
So that's really important context there that we're hearing from Jake Sullivan in terms of that number. And I'm told by officials it continues to move. There had been talk of dozens of Americans who were unaccounted for at the start of this because you have to piece together and imagine that somebody might be injured. Somebody sadly may have lost their life. The numbers, again, are going up and down. And then there's that number of how many are actually being held by Hamas. And the critical thing now is that the president is sending that team that is going to technically advise and help the Israeli counterparts on the ground to try to free all of the hostages, not just the Americans. But the important thing that a U.S. official stressed to me during these conversations is that there aren't any current plans for any U.S. troops or special forces to go in to extract Americans at this point, Hallie. Critical reporting, Monica, because that had been a key question here. Quickly, Secretary Blinken set to land in Israel on Thursday, a show of support, right, for that country. What else do we know about that? A major support and solidarity effort. That is really the point of him going. He will be arriving there and meeting with senior Israeli leaders to get the latest update on what is happening on the ground there. And then we understand that he will be hearing Israel's requests for additional assistance, things like ammunition, interceptors, the things we already know the U.S. military has been providing and that will likely continue to provide in addition to other possible military assistance that Secretary Blinken can negotiate and talk about about providing on the ground when he's there. Hallie. Monica Alba, live for us there outside the White House. Thank you. Israeli military officials describing the scenes of these Hamas attacks as not a battlefield, but a massacre. Journalists, including our own Raf Sanchez, taken through one community just decimated, where troops are going house to house to pull out bodies. It's now been four days since the surprise attack that caught Israel so badly off guard. But it feels like every hour we are learning new details about the scale of the horror committed by Hamas terrorists inside of Israeli territory. Earlier today, the Israeli military took us to a kibbutz called Kafar Aza, about half a mile from the Gaza border. It's the first time the media was allowed in to one of these communities that was overrun by Hamas gunmen in the early hours of Saturday morning. They showed us the breach in the kibbutz fence where these gunmen piled through and they took us from one house to the next showing us the burned out buildings sometimes people burn to death inside they showed us the blood on the floor and it felt like every few minutes israeli forces even four days on were still finding new bodies inside of this community now kafar Azo was home to 700 people no one can say at this point how many of them have lost their lives, how many of them are being held hostage inside of Gaza at this point. When President Biden spoke at the White House earlier today, he appeared visibly emotional, and we now have some sense why that may be. Prime Minister Netanyahu, according to an Israeli readout, really burrowed into the awful, awful detail of this in his call with the President of the United States. He talked about women being raped by the Hamas gunmen, which is something that's been widely reported, but the first time it has been confirmed officially by the Israeli government. He talked about Israeli soldiers being beheaded after they were killed. And he said the Jewish people have not seen a horror like this since the Holocaust, which may give you some sense of why President Biden was so outraged when he spoke earlier. Where we are in Ashkelon, there has been a relentless barrage of rockets over the last couple of hours. It is quiet now. We spoke to a young woman earlier in Gaza, a mother of a two-year-old baby girl uh, who has been forced to evacuate her home in the face of these Israeli airstrikes. I asked her, what do you tell your daughter about these bombs going off? She says she tries to tell her daughter, Sophia, that it's just a big car and there's nothing to be afraid of. But she says even this two-year-old girl knows the sounds of a bomb, a two-year-old who has already lived through several rounds of fighting. And that is a story you hear over and over again in different forms among the two million Palestinians in Gaza who are now caught in the crossfire of this horrific war. Back to you. Our thanks to Raf Sanchez for that reporting. One of the people now missing is 21-year-old Adi Mizel who was at a music festival in southern Israel where Hamas massacred at least 260 people. They took others hostage. You can see in some of the videos here people running for safety as these terrorist attacks happened. Adi's boyfriend describes her as just a charming person. So loved, mature, an athlete, 
called her hardworking and smart and independent. Her mother, who knows this well, is joining us now, Ahuva Mizel. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I know that this is unspeakably difficult for you. Um, can you give us any sense of the last time you heard any news about your daughter? Yes, it was Saturday morning, 7.42. It was the last time I talked to her. She called me, she was in the car, and she said that there was a lot of uh, shooting terrorists. And I couldn't understand exactly what she said. I, I heard that it's a lot of a uh, mess over there, but I could never, never imagine that I will sit here and tell you about it. I know that this has been um, just a, a, a nightmare for you. It's been the hardest family. four days of my life. Like How are you doing? This horror, it, it's something that words cannot describe what we feel. I have a daughter who went to a, to have fun, to, to party, to dance, to feel love. So innocent. No, no, no. She took nothing to defend herself. She was in her country, not in an enemy country, not in a different country, in her country. And we feel so helpless that we cannot help her against this monster people. I don't know how to say, how to describe, really, from day to day, the picture it becomes so clear and so ugly and so you cannot contain what you see. You know, my mind, I think he shuts parts of himself because you cannot, you cannot understand, contain these things. You cannot. It's absolutely hell on earth. This is hell. I'm in hell. And with me, so many other families, <laughs> you know, they, they, they came, they came to this party, they, they, they surrounded those kids, hundreds of terrorists, armed terrorists with machine guns, and just shoot all over with no distinction, just to kill, just <laughs> to break people just to to destroy and 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 if they didn't do that not a lot never long they also burned them they shoot them from zero range they rape them and now my daughter is there i don't know where i don't know how <laughs> how how she is i don't know what her condition if she's bleeding if she's I don't know where she, maybe she, she, maybe they have her, maybe they abducted her and they rape and they do such horrible things that, you know, your soul is tearing apart. I cannot imagine what she feels, what she's been through with all of these innocent people. Really, most of them were innocent children. None of them were, was a soldier, none of them hold a gun or, 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 a, or, or a weapon. So really, the more the picture clear, clears up, you know, the, you, the more you cannot accept what you see. Ahuva, if you could get a message to your daughter right now, what would you tell her? What do you want her to know? I would you, tell her my beautiful, idea, my beautiful idea. Dia ya fasheli at lo levad. Af echad mikem mi she shomea otam otam. Af echad mikem lo levad. Ve nachnu medinat Israel chazaka vi tavo vi tatzil otchem ve atem tachzeru le Israel. Lo meshane bez matzav atem tachzeru la medina shelachem la bayit shelachem la mishpacha shelachem la orim shelachem. <laughs> you are bearing um, a, a, a mother's burden that no human should bear. Um, and, I, and I've seen you talk about your daughter. You have been so um, 
so she's vocal everything and to me. shining her she's light. She's everything to her father. She's, she's the light of our family. She's <laughs> really, they're just all, all of them. There are lights. Why, why do you have to, to, to kill innocent people and, and brutalize, brutalize their bodies? They burned people in cars. I don't know if they're alive or after they shoot them. You know, this is things that you don't do. We, humankind did this in very dark ages. We are not then. We are not there. We are here. We are in 2023. How, what about some, some morality, some, some dignity to human rights, to basic human rights? Have you, how, how can people do things like that to other people? How, how? I cannot understand. Have you heard anything from any member of the Israeli government about the effort to try to find your daughter, to try to get her back home to you? Of course I did. I did. This work is so complicated. Our situation is very complicated because Israel is, is practically a war zone in every aspect of the world. And, and it's true that they surprised us. I understand that the, many mistakes have been made here. I, it's okay, it's obvious. But the main things, the main thing that we should concentrate in now is bringing those people back. These are young babies, old, sick people, women, innocent people that did nothing to Hamas at all, nothing at all. Don't do any harm to them. This is not right to gain what you want to, to achieve. I'm asking people to be human and maybe I'm naive and maybe I'm telling you I'm a peace person. I always thought that we should make peace with people that we share same DNA with them the same skin color. So why are you killing us? Because we are Jews, because we believe in... What, what, I, I don't understand. I don't understand why, why, for what, for land. And all I want to do is to protect my kid in my country. And I have no access to my kid that I'm sure that if she's, if she's alive, She's probably in a very bad condition. And and I cannot save her. You know? I, myself. I know, I know. Um, and, and you have so many people around the world, uh, not just in your country, but everywhere, praying for your daughter, <laughs> sending you strength, and thinking of you and your family tonight, hoping that she has returned to you and her home safely. Who and all for everybody's, for all yeah. families, this is what I wish for. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you. for the best, but expecting, unfortunately, the worst. Thank um, you. Mazel, thank you. And, and I appreciate you coordinating with us uh, from thousands of miles away, from half a world away, shining a spotlight on the story of your daughter and, and raising awareness of what people like you are going through tonight. Ahuva Mazel, thank you so much. We're going to be right Thanks. back. Key moves from the United States government today pledging to support the Iron Dome missile defense system in Israel with the bipartisan group from Congress introducing a proposal to try to give $2 billion more to the Iron Dome. This is something Israel has used for more than a decade, now relying on it as rockets flood the skies above the country. But how does it actually work? Here's NBC News' Molly Hunter with tonight's breakdown. In the sky today, that's a rocket arcing over the southern Israeli city of Ashkelon. And see that explosion? That's the Iron Dome missile defense system in action, intercepting and eliminating the projectile. It might seem like not much more than a blip in the sky, but take a look at the view at night. Each of those explosions right here, a thwarted rocket attack. The Israeli company that developed the Iron Dome system says the system has destroyed thousands of unguided rockets fired from Gaza and Lebanon into Israel since 2011. Oh, but the Iron Dome isn't really a dome, though it's meant to create a force field effect. They're movable batteries attached to missile launchers that look like this. 
And here's how it works. So first, its radar senses a rocket when it's getting close, anywhere from 2.5 to 43 miles away, according to Raytheon, a U.S. defense contractor that helps produce them. Then the Iron Dome's control center kicks into gear, quickly analyzes whether a rocket will hit populated areas. If it determines the rocket will hit a town or city, the system will tell a launcher to shoot off a missile that will intercept and destroy it midair. The fragments of metal and debris then fall to the ground. But if a rocket is headed for an unpopulated area, the Iron Dome will let it land in the desert or sea. Officials say the system is extremely effective. The Israeli Defense Forces reported that it intercepted more than 95% of rockets during an operation last May. Over the last few days, the Israeli military says 4,500 rockets were fired from Gaza, and the Iron Dome has intercepted many. Now we're hearing it again. Now you'll start to see the Iron Dome system taking them off again many rockets many interceptions not much damage but it doesn't catch every single one the u.s has given israel nearly two billion dollars for the iron dome since 2011 and that's in addition to the 3.3 billion dollars annually that it sends to israel for general security assistance and today president biden pledging even more support we're surging the additional military assistance, including ammunition and interceptors, to replenish Iron Dome. We're going to make sure that Israel does not run out of these critical assets. Making sure Israel can continue to save lives up in the air. Molly Hunter, NBC News. We are just learning tonight that Israeli soldiers have exchanged fire with a number of terrorists in the Ashkelon area of Israel just in the last hour, killing at least three of them, according to Israeli officials. This is near where you saw both Ali Velshi and not far from where you saw Raf Sanchez earlier in the show. We understand that Israeli soldiers are also looking for civilians in the area. It gives you a sense of just how active the fighting is, how active this war is on Israeli territory with the question next, what would a full-on military operation, a ground attack look like from Israel? When would it happen? Let me bring in our NBC News military analyst, Clint Watts, who's explaining this for us. And Clint, we wanted you posted up at the big board here to talk to us about what that would actually look like, specifically when it comes to the region, when it comes to the strategy here. What is the expectation? Yeah, Hallie, a way to think about this, and you just noted a few things that are really important. Here is Gaza down here. Earlier in the summer, what you saw was a lot of uh, IDF, uh, Israeli Defense Forces, deployed in the West Bank. That was partly because they had skirmishes that were happening there due to protests. That pulled a lot of forces away. But at the same point, we've already seen indications today that this could become a multi-front war. There are reports of rockets coming from Syria over the Golan Heights into northern Israel and brief skirmishes up on the Lebanon-Israel border. Remember, Hezbollah is up here in this northern section of Israel, southern part of Lebanon. Everyone's worried about this expanding to a bigger war. What we're talking about, though, today, which you just mentioned, is Ashkelon. This is where there are still firefights going between Hamas militants. Down here, they have secured nearly all of these towns for the first time. That is really something that was the first step for any sort of invasion into Gaza. And now for the ground war. If the Israelis are set to stage, I think you can see them set up a cordon all the way around Gaza and then start to pick and choose places. There is a key wall that runs right through the center of Gaza that they might try and use to cut the Gaza region into two parts. What about stepping back the regional picture more broadly here? Yeah, so what's interesting is on the regional front, Many dynamics are at play. Remember, before this conflict started, Israel in 2020 had normalized relations here with UAE. They were in negotiations with Saudi Arabia, and some believe that's part of the impetus for Hamas to push into this incursion. Everyone wants to know that Iran, which backs Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, if they were somehow behind the coordination of this attack, which, while simple in its methods, highly sophisticated in its coordination. Everyone is looking to see what countries will jump in, what company countries might help in a certain way, and the humanitarian crisis, which you start off on the show here in Egypt going into Gaza. Everyone's wanting to know, will Egypt take anybody in? As of right now, the wall is still very solid there, and the border is held secure, which creates a humanitarian disaster should the Israeli forces move in. Clint Watts, thank you so much for that clear explanation. Uh, it is helpful to get a picture of what that might look like. Appreciate it.
Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Texas Attorney General is planning to file criminal complaints against, this, against the state representatives who led his impeachment. He claims that they doxed him when they put out documents that included his home address. Remember, he was impeached in May over allegations of corruption and abuse of office, but was later acquitted. Number two, former baseball MVP Steve Garvey is entering the California Senate race. If he wins, he would become the first Republican senator from that state in decades. Garvey's hoping to fill the seat of the late Dianne Feinstein, who died last month. The seat is currently being held by Democrat LaFonza Butler, who's going to stay for the rest of Feinstein's term. Number three, singer Joe Jonas and actress Sophie Turner have come to a temporary child custody agreement, according to some new court documents. The two split up last month. They've been in a custody fight ever since. Under the agreement, the kids will rotate between each parent every few weeks. It says Turner can bring them to the UK with her if she chooses. Number four, the former head of FTX's sister hedge fund, Alameda Research, is testifying today against the now disgraced founder, Sam Bankman Freed. Caroline Ellison is also SBF's ex-girlfriend, and she says he directed her to defraud customers. She pleaded guilty to seven charges last year, including wire fraud and money laundering, and is now cooperating with prosecutors. Bankman Freed has pleaded not guilty, but could face life in prison if convicted. Number five, Powerball. It's now at almost $2 billion, 1.73 to be exact. The second biggest Powerball prize ever. The chances of hitting all six numbers and taking that money home with you, about one in 300 million. To Washington now, where the White House is defending the president's decision to both handle the crisis in Israel and sit for an interview with the special counsel investigating his handling of classified documents, essentially saying, hey, he can walk and chew gum at the same time. Watch. He's been very much focused uh, on the issues of the, you know, horror of events that we have seen in Israel. Uh, and, um, you know, the president is able to do multiple things at once, right? As president, he has to do multiple things at once. And that's what you saw him do this weekend. The White House saying those interviews were scheduled weeks ago before the war in Israel exploded over the weekend with that terror attack by Hamas leading to the president sitting down with the special counsel, Robert Hur himself. The White House says the president is cooperating with the investigation and being as transparent as we can, they say, consistent with protecting and preserving the integrity of the investigation. Remember what this is all about, right? Classified documents. The attorney general appointed her nine months ago, just about, to look into how some of these documents made their way from the White House after the vice presidency of Joe Biden and ended up at his home and a D.C. office. NBC News legal correspondent Laura Jarrett is joining us now. So, Laura, that's the sort of backstory here. Now we know that this interview has happened. There is a signal about how close this investigation could be to wrapping up that we can read from that, right? I think it's safe to assume that the investigation is in its final days, its final stretches. The question is, Hallie, as always, is what do we not know here? And there are some significant puzzle pieces I think we still have to put together. I say that because we don't know whether the special counsel got satisfactory answers. We don't know if the president's attorney shut down any lines of questioning. We know that he voluntarily sat down for this interview, which is meaningful and significant and the type of thing that you would typically see at the end of the investigation. Um, but again, there's some there's some missing pieces here. We know that the uh, interview was conducted by the special counsel, Robert Hur himself, which is meaningful. We know that it lasted over the course of two days, so it wasn't short. And it was coming in the midst of, obviously, this highly significant um, terrorist attack over the weekend. So again, some issues here that are still outstanding. The White House has always tried to draw a contrast, right, to point out the, you know, factual distinctions between the way that the President Biden, who was obviously vice president at the time, handled documents, and what happened in the instance of former President Trump, essentially based on what we know now that, for example, from what the White House said, Joe Biden and his staff immediately turned over the documents when they were found. He let investigators search his properties. Former President Trump, of course, being accused of obstructing that push at almost every turn here, Laura. Yeah, and I think there are some meaningful factual distinctions here. But again, we don't know all what the special counsel right. has turned up in the course of this investigation. We know that at least the public posture from this president is that he didn't mean to do it. He's apologetic for it. Um, he doesn't believe that he has the right to hold on to classified documents, we, as we have heard from former President Trump. But we don't know what else the special counsel has turned up. We believe that he has spoken with a lot of people in and around the president's orbit who could shine light on exactly how those documents ended up in his office office and in his home. And so I think we need to wait to see what else the special counsel reveals about this.
Laura Jarrett, thank you so much to Congress now because House Republicans are meeting as we speak to start trying to figure out some kind of agreement, if that is even possible, on who should lead them going forward. The two candidates who are looking to take the speaker's chair after Kevin McCarthy was ousted last week, Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan. And listen, we don't know if we're going to get a resolution here. You've got everybody sort of streaming into this meeting in just the last hour, Republicans at least in the House, to try to hear from these candidates, figure out, is there a consensus? Can one of them get enough people to actually become the next speaker of the House? That is ahead of what is expected to be an uh, internal vote, if you will, tomorrow sometime perhaps during the day. We will see what happens. It comes as there is a packed agenda in Congress, of course, not just this immediate crisis that is happening now, the Israel-Hamas war, and the push by Congress potentially to get some new money to help Israel. But there's also the issue of aid to Ukraine. And then, of course, that government funding deadline with that shutdown now coming up in mid-November. We're going to be watching all of that as it unfolds tonight. But we're also getting back to our top story here, the breaking news coverage on that war between Hamas and Israel, with new fears that the fighting could now spread to other parts of the region. We are live in Lebanon in just a second. Plus, the UN push to try to get humanitarian help to Palestinian civilians trapped in Gaza. Next. Concern now of a looming humanitarian crisis as over 180,000 Palestinians in Gaza are looking to try to find shelter in UN facilities here. This is as the WHO and the UN today called for some kind of a humanitarian corridor to be established in and out of the Gaza Strip. You can see some of these trucks from Egypt bringing in food and fuel to Gaza, making a U-turn after the only crossing point between Egypt and Gaza was bombed and shut down. The border closing has left some families separated, like this Egyptian dad who is pleading on TikTok here begging, essentially, the Egyptian president to try to help him reunite with his wife and daughter who are trapped in Gaza. Matt Bradley is joining us live now from Lebanon. And Matt, this is part of the, one of the concerns moving forward here. The State Department has said that there are some 500 Palestinian Americans who are on in Gaza right now, in the Gaza Strip here. Obviously, we know that Israel has blockaded no food, no fuel, no electricity, in or out, etc. Talk to us about what we're hearing from international organizations and the plan for civilians there now. Yeah, the, well, the main international organization that deals with the Gaza Strip is the UN Relief Works Agency, and they have sounded the alarm. But the fact is, Hallie, they were sounding the alarm long ago, ever since this blockade started uh, way back in the 2000s. Uh, there, there was a desperate humanitarian situation for a long time. And now, as you mentioned, there's 137,000 Palestinians who are seeking refuge, and this is in UNRWA shelters. That's about 6% of the population of Gaza. Now, we're also hearing from the World Health Organization and others, they're warning uh, that the power, the electricity uh, that's run by the Gaza power plant could run out in days because, as you mentioned, the Israelis have said that they're going to be cutting off electricity in addition to water. Now, the water situation there, again, already desperate. There was already a lot of diseases, waterborne illnesses uh, that were circulating amongst the population because the water situation was so bad. There was uh, not a lot of access to clean water because of this blockade. Now, we're also hearing from the, the U.N. World Health Organization saying that there have been 11 attacks on health facilities. Again, already underfunded, already undersupplied because of that more than a decade, nearly two decade long blockade on the Gaza Strip. So those 11 attacks that have already struck health facilities, that's already complicating the situation. The U.N. Uh, Relief Works Agency is already saying that there have been strikes on places like schools and other UNRWA facilities that were uh, essentially shelters and places where people were seeking refuge. Because I think I was talking about this with you yesterday. You know, we heard from Benjamin Netanyahu saying, if you're in Gaza, get out. Well, there's no place for any of these people to go, except for UNWA shelters. And that means that they're stuck between a rock and a hard place, as the Israeli military musters now 360,000 reservists, in addition to its regular military, to move in. And, well, we don't know what they're going to do. We can assume that they're going to do the worst in the Gaza Strip. Hallie. Matt, you bring up something important here, right, as you've laid out the many challenges that are coming essentially down the pipeline here. So, so many of them in this, um, this crisis here. The, the border closings, right? You talk about people trying to get in, presumably, though, out. That's the bigger issue. We talked about that father, right, the, the Egyptian dad who is looking to reunite with the rest of his family. Is there any indication that, talk about the Egypt factor here, there could be any movement on that border? 
Uh, it doesn't seem like that because the Israelis have already threatened the Egyptians, saying that if they bring in, as you mentioned in your introduction, if they bring in any relief into the Gaza Strip, that they will attack them. Now, that's a major escalation because Egypt was really the first uh, you know, Arab country to recognize Israel. And now, as diplomatically, they've been a longtime partner, security partner, especially in dealing with the Gaza Strip, which recently, ever since the Arab Spring, the, uh, the Egyptians have considered the Gaza Strip to be a source of political instability for their own country. So they have always been cooperating with the Israelis. Now the Israelis are threatening to attack Egyptians who bring in supplies into Israel. That's a major escalation for one of Israel's major Arab partners. It just goes to show how angry the Israelis are and the lengths they're willing to go to in order to keep anything from getting into the Gaza Strip and anyone from getting out. Hallie? Matt Bradley, live for us in the region there. Matt, thank you so much for that critical context and reporting. I want to bring in Andrea Mitchell now for more analysis on this. And Andrea, we're just getting to this new video now of Israeli tanks deploying to the border with Lebanon today, where we just heard from Matt Bradley. Talk about here the concern that this could um, essentially blow up beyond not just Israel, Gaza, but to other parts of the region here, because it seems like that is some of the focus for some of these officials that I know we're talking to. Absolutely, Hallie. That's the right question, because Secretary Blinken is now going tomorrow to the Middle East, to Israel and to Jordan. And that's partly to talk to not only Israel and make sure that they were all on the same page, and they are on the same page with Netanyahu, completely on security and on the response here in Gaza to this horrendous assault, unprecedented assault. But in addition to talk to others in the region and to go to Jordan, a key player, uh, the second Arab country to recognize Israel and to talk about not letting this spread further. And the other piece of that is the deployment of the USS Gerald Ford, the battle group, the car aircraft carrier battle group, uh, to the Eastern Mediterranean, not only to deter Iran uh, and its proxies, Hezbollah in Lebanon, from doing anything to spread this, but also to be available if it does spread to the northern you know, region, to a northern front, a second front from Hezbollah, which has 130,000 rockets, sophisticated rockets, far more sophisticated than what Hamas has, uh, aimed, targeted at Israel. If that were to happen, a major assault, uh, James Trevides told us earlier today that he thinks it would be very uh, immediately uh, responded to by fighter jets launching from that battleship from that aircraft carrier, rather. So uh, that would bring the U.S. directly into confrontation with Lebanon, Hezbollah, right. but really with Iran. There's also this piece of it, Andrea, as we, as we cover now um, this war with Israel and Hamas. We've also, as you well know, have covered over the course of the last year and a half a different war, right? The war uh, in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of that country. Mm -hmm. There is now a potential link here because our team is reporting that the White House and some key lawmakers are looking at whether to link help to Ukraine, to, to Israel, to more funding for Ukraine. Jake Sullivan talked about this, the National Security Advisor. Let me play that. It is so much more cost effective to take the action now as opposed to pay the huge price later. We firmly reject the notion that the United States of America cannot at once support the freedom, freedom of love and people of Ukraine and support the state of Israel. Talk to us how we should be thinking about um, both of these issues, different parts of the world, obviously, but, but interconnected now in a way that, um, that is, is complicated but important. Well, one of the problems with resupplying Israel is that they also need money. They need money for parts, parts that cannot be supplied by the U.S. Mm -hmm. from our stockpiles. So they, they need to have the financing, and nothing can happen from the pipeline. No money can come from the pipeline. It has to come from an appropriation, a supplemental appropriation. And that can't happen without a Speaker of the House. So it's really a domino thing where the stalemate in Washington, unless it's resolved in the next 24, 48 hours, it's really potentially going to hurt Israel. And by tying Israel to Ukraine, I think the White House feels they can pick up some support because there is more widespread support for Israel than there is for a supplemental for Ukraine. Andrea Mitchell, thank you so much for being with us here live from here in Washington. Thanks. Coming up here on the show, what we're just learning about a coordinated disinformation campaign about the war involving dozens of accounts on X and why so many of this kind of thing is still going around. That's after a break.
NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Western Bureau, a man is dead after driving a car into the Chinese consulate in San Francisco, according to police. He was apparently shot by officers and died at the hospital. A White House official tells the Associated Press that officials are in contact with Chinese foreign ministry officials. Police say they're still investigating. Out of our Northeast Bureau, police in New York say they will not charge a school bus driver who was fired for drinking an alcoholic seltzer while driving students. She says she took a can from the fridge she shares with a roommate and didn't realize that the drink had booze in it. The 60-year-old telling our NBC News affiliate she is going through cancer treatments that affect her sense of taste. And out of our West Coast Bureau, a new world record for the heaviest pumpkin in the world. A teacher from Minnesota grew it, showed it off at the World Pumpkin Championship way off in California, 2,800 pounds. Back to our top story of the night, of course, and that is the war between Israel and Hamas. New into NBC Tonight, a research group uncovering a network of dozens of accounts on X, formerly known as Twitter, spreading what's, spreading, rather, what's believed to be coordinated posts with disinformation about the war. Posts and videos that have been viewed millions of times. X started suspending some of the accounts after they were contacted by NBC News, but didn't otherwise have any comment. It's something we've seen a lot of over the past few days. Take this video saying Hamas militants started a new airstrike on Israel. You see that? That's, that, video, that is actually from a video game. That's not even real. You see the exact same video posted to YouTube here. Then there was this post claiming Israel bombed and destroyed an old Greek Orthodox church in Gaza. It has something like 3 million views. But the church itself said it hasn't been touched, that any other news is false. All of these posts now have disclaimers on the bottom if you go to X and look at the post, but they're not taken down. And some of them are posted from verified users, making it harder for people to know what's real. NBC News tech correspondent Jake Ward is joining us now. And Jake, there, these are just a couple of examples of this. These posts containing misinformation, disinformation, very difficult, especially at a moment like this, when people are, frankly, desperate for information, turning to social media platforms. It is not a clear-cut picture. It is not a clear-cut picture, Hallie. The past few days have just been this vivid lesson in the fact that you literally cannot trust what social media feeds you these days. Uh, and even more difficult is the surprise turn of events, which means that uh, legitimate sources of information are slow to react because they were taken just as surprised as, as so many people were across Israel. So a very, very difficult moment. But as you say, there's just this proliferation of, of misleading content. And when it's not just made up, as in the case of the video game clip you're uh, shown there, um, you know, it's it's out of context or out of time. This video of, of uh, an attack by Israeli forces on Gaza is, in fact, that what it purports to be. But it's from May, not from this current set of attacks. And so you have things out of time like that. Not only that, you have whole presidential proclamations being concocted out of thin air. This, uh, uh, th there's a, a piece of, of uh, Biden looking, legitimate looking Biden information uh, it, that looks to, that purports to say that $8 billion will be set aside for Israel. It's in fact a doctored copy of what you see there on the right, which is the 400 million that Biden put toward Ukrainian aid. You know, this is the kind of stuff that is coming fast and furious right now. And it's happening, of course, because because social media is cutting back on the people who try to patrol this stuff. I mean, X, as you mentioned, is really the, the, the locus of so much of this stuff because they have cut back so many of their teams, their elections integrity team, their trust and safety teams. All of those have been scaled back. X has had no comment for us on this, um, but they have been cutting back, we know from many reports and many sources. And that's also true across social media. You have uh, Twitter, you have Meta, you have uh, all these different companies cutting back on the very people that we trust to try and keep this stuff uh, uh, as reliable as possible. And that has just made the fog of war all that much deeper right now, Hallie. You talk about the issue specifically as it relates to X, of course, old Twitter, basically. The EU, I mean, has put out this notice basically for Elon Musk to come and respond to X's role in the spread of some of this content, of this disinformation over there. That's right. Here in the United States, misinformation is considered a scourge, but it's not fundamentally illegal. In the EU, it's different. Under the Digital Services Act, uh, Thierry Breton, the commissioner, has sent Elon Musk this demand that he stop letting this stuff move around on the platform uh, and that he'll face consequences if it doesn't uh, stop immediately. He's given him 24 hours to do it. And so the EU really reminding us uh, that, again, you cannot trust what comes to you on the social media feed. Really, the only reliable thing that we can do at this point 
point, uh, Hallie, is try to go out and find reliable information. Do not trust what's coming to you yeah. in the passive way that social media is built to feed it to you. You have to go find reliable so sources, especially in difficult times like this, Hallie. Jake Ward, thank you so much. When we come back, much more here on the show, including growing backlash over a group of Harvard students' letter was pro-Palestinian. What that university and others are saying about criticism on campus. Plus, another demonstration we're seeing in New York tonight. We're going to be live there. Stay with us. New protests tonight over Hamas's war with Israel. Take a look at Columbia University. Hundreds of students there wrapped in Israeli flags, praying, singing together. It comes as pro-Palestinian student groups at some top universities are putting out statements supporting the Hamas attack. Here's a statement signed by 35 pro-Palestinian organizations at Harvard. You may have read about this or seen this here. It says in part, I'm quoting, that they hold the Israeli regi regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence, adding these events did not occur in a vacuum. For the last two decades, millions of Palestinians in Gaza have been forced to live in an open-air prison. Now... You're seeing some prominent alumni of Harvard, like Republican lawmakers Senator Ted Cruz, Congressman Elise Stefanik hitting back, with Cruz posting on X, what the hell is wrong with Harvard? Stefanik calling the statement abhorrent and heinous. We've seen similar statements from pro-Palestinian groups at Stanford, at Yale, at Columbia. Stephen Romo is joining us now outside of Columbia in New York. Talk through what we're hearing about some of the, the response here and the way that this has become part of the domestic issue around what's happening with this war. Yeah, Hallie, there's been a lot of heated criticism about these statements we're getting, not only from schools themselves, but from just students and student organizations who attend these schools. And you mentioned that rally that happened earlier here tonight at Columbia. Students coming together, uh, it didn't really seem like a rally. It was so somber, people crying and praying together. But we did get the opportunity to ask students what they think about Columbia's response. I saw a lot of very negative and a hurtful uh, emails from presidents of university, from student unions. For Columbia's response, it was a very mixed review. It took the president, I believe, a couple of days to make a, an email commenting on it. Once she did, it seemed like a very positive email that, to the community. Now, it was a very different reaction from the students at Columbia who were supporting uh, people from uh, the Palestinian region at this time. They were saying that they were unhappy the faculty statements did not go far enough in defending uh, innocent Palestinians who may be injured or killed in the ongoing violence. They did not go as far, though, as the Harvard student groups that you mentioned earlier, those 35 groups blaming Israel for the terrorist attacks carried out by Hamas. Now, Harvard has been in the spotlight since those comments by the students group were made uh, over the weekend. University President Claudine Gay released a statement yesterday that some think did not go far enough in condemning Hamas and uh, anti-Semitism in general. So she released a new statement today on that topic and on the topic of the student groups, saying in part, quote, let there be no doubt that I condemn the terrorist atrocities perpetrated by Hamas while our students have the right to speak for themselves, no student group, not even 30 student groups, speak for Harvard University or its leadership. Now, former Harvard president Larry Summers also had a lot to say about what these students groups put out in that statement. This is an atrocity at an extraordinarily level. And yet it has not been condemned. It's not complicated. It's not intellectual. It's not subtle. It is wrong. And that should be something that can be understood on our leading campuses. Now, it's, uh, of course, the controversy is not going to be over on campuses. In fact, we learned tonight the Harvard-Palestine Solidarity Group was planning to have a vigil tonight, but they say they had to cancel that due to some concerns for their safety tonight. So likely to see more of this going forward, Hallie. Stephen Romo, live for us there outside Columbia. Stephen, thank you so much. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. 
Hey there, I'm Hallie, and as we come on the air, we are learning more about this hostage crisis now in the war between Israel and Hamas. As you take a live look, here it is at Gaza tonight. We have seen, of course, explosions in the sky as the Israeli Iron Dome system intercepts short-range missiles, short-range fire coming over the border there. In Israel, too, a dramatic rescue push now to try to get survivors of this war back to their loved ones. This is body cam video released from Israeli police. They say it shows officers on a rescue mission to try to save some hostages in southern Israel or near southern Israel. The video was blurred before being distributed. NBC News can't independently confirm what happened, but it gives you a sense of what's happening on the ground. President Biden can confirm that Americans are among those missing. Officials say about 20 of them. And 14 Americans have been killed after what the president calls this attack of sheer evil. This is terrorism. But sadly, for the Jewish people, it's not new. Secretary of State Tony Blinken headed to Israel tomorrow with growing pressure and growing desperation from some families who want help, who haven't heard from the people they love in days. We're on the call with her as the terrorist barged into her home. And we heard a little bit of screaming. They were throwing grenades in, shooting machine guns, and we know that Hirsch's arm from the elbow down was um, severed. The last time uh, that we heard from him was uh, Saturday morning, where he uh, said that they were under attack. The war, already leaving more than 1,800 people dead in the few days since it started, over 1,000 people killed in Israel according to that embassy. The health ministry in Gaza and the West Bank says at least 900 people have been killed there. And you hear that, those are some of the sirens, the explosions in the coastal city of Ashkelon. And here are some video showing what looks like fishing boats on fire in the port of Gaza city. Strikes like those hitting neighborhoods across the region, lining streets like this one with bodies at a scale officials say they have never seen before. In Gaza, emergency responders rushing, hurt children, covered in debris and blood, images illustrating the grim and terrible cost of war, including what we're about to show you, just one time. Because while it is disturbing, you will find it hard to watch. It is also the reality of what's happening right now. This video showing Israeli hostages taken by Hamas over the weekend. And new images coming into us now show those same people dead. We've obviously blurred their bodies. It is a nightmare. And tonight, the pressure on Gaza's borders with both Israel and Egypt is growing with concerns about a potential mass exodus from the Gaza Strip through what's known as the Rafa border crossing in Egypt. You saw that on the map, and you can see here some of the crowds today, people arriving with their families, their suitcases, trying to get out. Ali Velshi is in Ashdod for us. Raf Sanchez is in Ashkelon. We just showed you that in Israel. Monica Alba has the latest from the White House in Washington. But I want to start with Ali Velshi for us now. So, Ali, we are just getting word here now that the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, say the first plane carrying U.S. armaments, essentially, um, uh, military apparatus to help the Israelis, has just landed now in Israel. It is another step here in what has been a process over the course of the last several days for the U.S. to fortify aid to one of its closest allies. That's right. Uh, an, an airplane uh, carrying the first shipment of armaments has arrived. It's 100 kilometers to the southeast. That's the east of uh, of where Gaza is. That equipment's there over to uh, the uh, the side over here or the west, the Mediterranean. The strike group, the Gerald uh, the Gerald Ford strike group has arrived uh, to sh as a show of support, but also to help equip uh, the the Israeli effort to plunge uh, Gaza, uh, you know, into into the darkness that you see back there. Gaza is behind me. So the Americans are reinforcing this effort. The way the President Biden did say today that he would be doing so. All of this is important for Israel, but it is not clear how it helps the immediate problem, which you just talked about, and that is the hostages and the fact that we've now seen some dead bodies of hostages. This is the thing that so many of these uh, Israeli families, including about 100 of them who we are know, who know that their, their loved ones are being kept hostage, that's the thing they want to prioritize. Get our families out. The, everything else is secondary. Decapitating uh, uh, Hamas and its abilities and its capacities is, is secondary to them. Now, for most of Israel, they want to see Hamas punished for the worst 
few days uh, in, in Israel's history. Uh, they don't, you know, th there are two different aims here, and getting the hostages out is probably one of the most tricky things that they're thinking about right mm -hmm. now, along with the White House. They're trying to figure out how to get these hostages right. out because we know that there are Americans in there as well. You talk about, and we don't know the exact number, we know maybe roughly 20, although that number does seem to be fluid. It is at least a starting point here. I know that you yes. talked with one mother who thought her uh, husband might have been kidnapped. Turns out the reality was far worse. Yeah, so it was on a, it was bordering um, the, bordering Gaza. It was a it was a kibbutz bordering Gaza. She was trapped with her husband and her one month old son for 28 hours. Her husband told her when an opportunity came out, run with the baby. So she ran, got herself to a shelter. The army finally found her. She went to her mother's house south of Tel Aviv. I was on my way there this morning to talk to her. She believed that her husband was a hostage. As we arrived at her house, she, we heard screaming. She was yelling into the phone, "Why are you telling me this?" By phone. It was mm -hmm. the army calling to tell her that her husband was found dead. I did speak. Her mother came out to speak to me. She was too distraught to speak to me. And this is what her mother told me. She's not okay. She won't no. be okay. She won't be okay. We cannot be okay after such a tragedy. But we will do our best that we can to help. That's what we can. We must be strong. We must help. A child by one month. One month old baby and uh, and the mother now without their father, without her, the, the baby's father and without her husband. What is something, Allie, that you wish people back here at home um, knew or could capture that you've experienced there on the ground or that you've seen on the ground? You know, war seems sterile sometimes. Rockets landing places and bombs landing places. What you see here is is the humanity and the lack of humanity in it. That's the thing that people need to understand. It's a thing that struck me in Ukraine. It's a thing that strikes me whenever I see places like this. Innocent people who are non-combatants who just want to live their lives died on Saturday. Uh, and now more innocent people will die because of the back and forth between Gaza and Israel. And the justifications or, or, or lack of justifications for all the bad things that have happened don't put aside the fact that innocent people who are not part of a war, who don't think about politics every day, are dead and will continue to die. It's, it's, it breaks one's heart. Ali Velshi, we appreciate you being there, doing the reporting for us on the ground. Israeli military officials are describing the scenes of these Hamas attacks not as a battlefield, but as a massacre. And today, some journalists, including our own Raf Sanchez, were taken through one community that has just been obliterated, with troops going house to house to pull out bodies. It's now been four days since the surprise attack that caught Israel so badly off guard, but it feels like every hour we are learning new details about the scale of the horror committed by Hamas terrorists inside of Israeli territory. Earlier today, the Israeli military took us to a kibbutz called Kafar Aza, about half a mile from the Gaza border. It's the first time the media was allowed in to one of these communities that was overrun by Hamas gunmen in the early hours of Saturday morning. They showed us the breach in the kibbutz fence where these gunmen piled through, and they took us from one house to the next, showing us the burned out buildings. Sometimes people burn to death inside. They showed us the blood on the floor. And it felt like every few minutes, Israeli forces, even four days on, were still finding new bodies inside of this community. Now, Kafar Aza was home to 700 people. No one can say at this point how many of them have lost their lives, how many of them are being held hostage inside of Gaza at this point. When President Biden spoke at the White House earlier today, he appeared visibly emotional, and we now have some sense why that may be. Prime Minister Netanyahu, according to an Israeli readout, really burrowed into the awful, awful detail of this in his call with the President of the United States. He talked about women being raped by the Hamas gunmen, which is something that's been widely reported, but the first time it has been confirmed officially by the Israeli government. He talked about Israeli soldiers being beheaded after they were killed, and he said the Jewish people have not seen a horror like this since the Holocaust, which may give you some sense of why President Biden was so outraged when he spoke earlier. Where we are in Ashkelon, there has been a relentless barrage of rockets over the last couple of hours. It is quiet now. 
We spoke to a young woman earlier in Gaza, a mother of a two-year-old baby girl uh, who has been forced to evacuate her home in the face of these Israeli airstrikes. I asked her, what do you tell your daughter about these bombs going off? She says she tries to tell her daughter, Sophia, that it's just a big car and there's nothing to be afraid of. But she says even this two-year-old girl knows the sounds of a bomb, a two-year-old who has already lived through several rounds of fighting. And that is a story you hear over and over again in different forms among the two million Palestinians in Gaza who are now caught in the crossfire of this horrific war. Back to you. Araf Sanchez reporting there. Among those missing, a father who was visiting a friend near Gaza when Hamas first attacked Israel. You can see the photos of 66-year-old Gidon Babani with his daughter. She didn't even know that that's where her dad was at first, that he was down by Gaza. And when she found out, she just hasn't been able to get a hold of him. He was with his girlfriend, who she believes may be dead now. His daughter, Aliyah Tamam, is joining us now. Aliyah, thank you so much for being with us. And we are so sorry um, to hear about what you are going through. How are you doing? My first, uh, thank you very much for letting us hear our voice. Um, it's a difficult time. It's um, last uh, Saturday, we woke up to a different reality, uh, literally a nightmare. Uh, we we are not good. We're trying to to find any piece of information to find them, to try to help them, to try to understand what happened there. Yeah. We keep receiving um, uh, some information and uh, different information from different people. We don't know what happened there. And we're just trying to, to find them and to understand what happened them. And did it, is it your belief, is it your understanding, Aaliyah, that your dad has been taken hostage, that he was abducted? For what people are saying, um, they saw him running away and captured. He was running away, he was hiding inside the house with his partner. Um, she managed to talk with her brother in the, in the morning. She told him, they are under attack. They are uh, being shot at, and and they are hiding, and they are trying to escape. And we received today a message from uh, from a friend of my father's partner that say that they trying to escape after the terrorist broke into their house, the the house they that they were staying in, and. Uh, they they uh, explode a grenade inside the house and captured my father, uh, meaning he will trying to escape. We we are not we don't know for certain that that what was happening because uh, we just heard from someone that maybe was there um, and saw something, but we don't know for certain that that was what was happened. And we are trying to to figure out to to speak with people who were there to um, to speak with with the government or to to reach to someone for for getting some answers. We feel uh, hopelessness and uh, really frustration to to can't help them and find them and don't know what happened. When you talk about. I think how how appropriately desperate you are to try to get information, to try to find out more about what happened to your father. Can you talk about who is liaising with you? Who is in contact or in communication with you? Is it the Israeli government? Is it local officials? What do you need the most right now? What is your biggest priority, obviously, besides finding your father, but from a logistical perspective? No one has spoken with us yet. No, no one from the government, no one from the security, no one has spoken with us. Um, we don't know for certain what happened. I really need someone to give me some answers and know what to do from now. And um, 
I just don't know. I, ju I just know the kibbutz is empty. There is no people in the kibbutz. Um, and they are not found in there. They're still missing. And I don't know if they're alive. They have been captured. They're dead. I, I don't know. I just uh, know from some people that told us what, what was there, yeah. but not from uh, someone that can tell us for sure that that was what happened. Uh, Aliyah, we are so grateful to you for sharing the story of your dad, the story of what happened. And there are so many people who are hoping that you do get the answers that you are looking for um, and that your dad is, is returned to you and safely along with so many others in this crisis. Aliyah Tamam, thank you very much for being with us tonight. It's such a difficult thank you. time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You heard Aliyah talking about the need for answers, the need for help here. And in just the last couple of hours, we've heard from President Biden laying out what the U.S. is trying to do now to help one of our closest allies, starting with replenishing some key ammo and interceptors for the Iron Dome air defense system. Importantly here, as it relates to that hostage crisis we were just talking about, sending a team of technical experts to help work with the Israelis on how to rescue hostages. This is not like special forces, U.S. special forces heading over there for extraction of hostages, but it is some technical expertise. The other piece of this, moving military apparatus closer, the Gerald Ford aircraft carrier, several destroyers and fighter jets. As we reported just a few minutes ago, some of that military armament apparatus is already arriving in Israel now, has just landed the first shipment at least. You have the president emotional and forceful today. Listen. You know, there are moments in this life, and I mean this literally, when the pure, unadulterated evil is unleashed on this world. People of Israel live through one such moment this weekend. Hamas tonight. This is the president calling them a terrorist organization, saying that they reject the fallacies in the president's speech. Let me bring in Monica Alba, who is joining us now outside the White House. And Monica, um, there are a lot of pieces to this here. Um, the, the confirmation that we heard from President Biden that Americans are among the missing, are among the people being held by Hamas. Uh, it, a, a incredibly significant moment here, in addition, of course, to the hundreds of people who are confirmed killed in Israel. One father of a dual citizen who is missing was talking with us earlier today. I want to play it. What we urge uh, President Biden is not to take a back seat here and, and take the lead only of Israel dealing with this situation. We have not heard anything clear from the State Department what they've done so far or what they plan to do uh, going forward. Monica, talk to us about the pressure that President Biden is now facing, this growing pressure from some of these families who are just, as we heard in the interview we just did, just so desperate now for answers. Yeah, it's an unbearable anguish, Hallie. You can absolutely sense it there. And the White House says they are very keenly aware of that, that they have been in touch with some of these families who have reached out searching for information about their loved ones who remain missing, who remain unaccounted for. We know that some of the families who have tragically lost loved ones here, Americans, some dual citizens of Israel and the U.S., that their families have been in touch with the Biden administration in some form. But there is just such a fluidity here, and there are so many different people involved and so many different families that that certainly adds to the complexity. So the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan today saying they're trying to do everything they can and that they will do more and they will endeavor to be in touch with everybody who wants to be in touch with them, and they're working feverishly to do that. And we got a little bit more of information just about how many Americans are still missing. Here's a little bit of that from Jake Sullivan earlier today. We believe that there are 20 or more Americans who at this point are missing, but I want to underscore and stress that does not mean necessarily that there are 20 or more American hostages. Just that is the number who are currently unaccounted for. 
So yesterday we knew that it was likely there were Americans who were going to be held hostage by Hamas. Today the president obviously confirmed that. There you see Jake Sullivan saying that it doesn't mean all 20 of them are, but a fraction of them at least could be. And then that number of 14 Americans killed in these terrorist attacks, I'm told by U.S. officials, could also likely go up just to show the scale of all of this. It's obviously not just the White House in touch with some of these families, but the State Department, law enforcement, the FBI taking a very active role in all of this. And then that technical team of experts on the ground with Israeli counterparts with the aim to help get people out, not just Americans, but of course, including Americans with a very high priority in terms of their expertise as well. Hallie. Monica Alba, live for us outside the White House. Mon, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Key moves now as Monica has laid out from the government today to try to support Israel, including more support to the Iron Dome missile defense system there. You've got this group from Congress now saying they want to give $2 billion to the Iron Dome system. Obviously, that is on hold while there's no Speaker of the House. But as you talk about the Iron Dome, it's a system, you're looking at some of it here, that Israel has used for more than a decade, relying on it as rockets flood the skies above the country. But how does it actually work? Here's NBC News' Molly Hunter with tonight's breakdown. In the sky today, that's a rocket arcing over the southern Israeli city of Ashkelon. And see that explosion? That's the Iron Dome missile defense system in action, intercepting and eliminating the projectile. It might seem like not much more than a blip in the sky, but take a look at the view at night. Each of those explosions right here, a thwarted rocket attack. The Israeli company that developed the Iron Dome system says the system has destroyed thousands of unguided rockets fired from Gaza and Lebanon into Israel since 2011. Oh, but the Iron Dome isn't really a dome, though it's meant to create a force field effect. They're movable batteries <laughs> attached to missile launchers that look like this. And here's how it works. So first, its radar senses a rocket when it's getting close, anywhere from 2.5 to 43 miles away, according to Raytheon, a U.S. defense contractor that helps produce them. Then the Iron Dome's control center kicks into gear, quickly analyzes whether a rocket will hit populated areas. If it determines the rocket will hit a town or city, the system will tell a launcher to shoot off a missile that will intercept and destroy it midair. The fragments of metal and debris then fall to the ground. Round. But if a rocket is headed for an unpopulated area, the Iron Dome will let it land in the desert or sea. Officials say the system is extremely effective. The Israeli Defense Forces reported that it intercepted more than 95 percent of rockets during an operation last May. Over the last few days, the Israeli military says 4,500 rockets were fired from Gaza and the Iron Dome has intercepted many. Now we're hearing it again. Now you'll start to see the Iron Dome system taking them off again. Many rockets, many interceptions, not much damage. But it doesn't catch every single one. The U.S. has given Israel nearly $2 billion for the Iron Dome since 2011. And that's in addition to the $3.3 billion annually that it sends to Israel for general security assistance. And today, President Biden pledging even more support. We're surging the additional military assistance, including ammunition and interceptors to replenish Iron Dome. We're going to make sure that Israel does not run out of these critical assets. Making sure Israel can continue to save lives up in the air. Molly Hunter, NBC News. We are just learning that Israeli soldiers exchanged fire with a number of terrorists in the Ashkelon area of Israel, not far from where you just saw Raf Sanchez in just the last few hours, killing at least three of them, according to Israeli officials. Uh, it is, in fact, we understand part of the picture is Israeli soldiers are looking for civilians in the area, giving you a sense of how active the fighting is, how active the war is on Israeli territory. With the question now, what would a full-on military operation, a ground attack, look like from Israel? Clint, we wanted you posted up at the big board here to talk to us about what that would actually look like, specifically when it comes to the region, when it comes to the strategy here. What is the expectation? Yeah, Hallie, a way to think about this, and you just noted a few things that are really important. Here is Gaza down here. 
Earlier in the summer, what you saw was a lot of uh, IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, deployed in the West Bank. That was partly because they had skirmishes that were happening there from, due to protests. That pulled a lot of forces away. But at the same point, we've already seen indications today that this could become a multi-front war. There are reports of rockets coming from Syria over the Golan Heights into northern Israel and brief skirmishes up on the Lebanon-Israel border. Remember, Hezbollah is up here in this northern section of Israel, southern part of Lebanon, everyone's worried about this expanding to a bigger war. What we're talking about, though, today, which you just mentioned, is Ashkelon. This is where there are still firefights going between Hamas militants. Down here, they have secured nearly all of these towns for the first time. That is really something that was the first step for any sort of invasion into Gaza. And now for the ground war. If the Israelis are set to stage, I think you can see them set up a cordon all the way around Gaza and then start to pick and choose places. There is a key wall that runs right through the center of Gaza that they might try and use to cut the Gaza region into two parts. What about stepping back the regional picture more broadly here? Yeah, so what's interesting is on the regional front, Many dynamics are at play. Remember, before this conflict started, Israel in 2020 had normalized relations here with UAE. They were in negotiations with Saudi Arabia, and some believe that's part of the impetus for Hamas to push into this incursion. Everyone wants to know that Iran, which backs Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, if they were somehow behind the coordination of this attack, which, while simple in its methods, highly sophisticated in its coordination. Everyone is looking to see what countries will jump in, what company countries might help in a certain way, and the humanitarian crisis, which you start off on the show here in Egypt going into Gaza. Everyone's wanting to know, will Egypt take anybody in? As of right now, the wall is still very solid there, and the border is held secure, which creates a humanitarian disaster should the Israeli forces move in. Clint Watts, thank you so much for that clear explanation. Uh, it is helpful to get a picture of what that might look like. Appreciate it. More on our top story, the war in Israel throughout the hour, including a live report from back here in the United States from Florida, where crowds are gathering for a vigil to support Israel. We're going to take you there live coming up in just a minute. Tonight, so many communities here in the U.S. still in shock after what unfolded with that terror attack against Israel perpetrated by Hamas on Saturday. You now are seeing people holding vigils all around the country with organizers at one rally in Miami saying they expect as many as 5,000 people to attend. There's also a lot of local police getting into place to try to make sure that things stay peaceful. I want to go to NBC's Sam Brock, who is live for us at that rally. Sam, talk us through what you're seeing and what you're hearing from people there. Obviously, we see it, the big crowd behind you. Sure. Um, it's a huge crowd, Howley. You're right. It's in the thousands. There's no question about that. I mean, you see rows upon rows of people over my shoulder. This goes all the way back into the street in this direction. In the other direction, there is a stage to my right. And right now we're listening to a variety of speakers. We're expected to hear from Marco Rubio, the Florida senator, the uh, Jeanette Nunez, uh, the lieutenant governor here in Florida, among other community leaders, religious leaders. And I will tell you, I spoke with the consul general of Israel. He told me this is not just about Hamas versus Israel. This is a battle of good versus evil, lightness versus darkness, as we learn about the barbaric details of what happened to these Israeli residents, the babies and grandmothers and loved ones who were killed and beheaded, according to reports. To describe the scene for you, Hallie, right now, I mean, beyond just the population of people, there are snipers. And I'm actually going to have you turn over here a little bit, Todd. Look at the rooftop here, okay? You have people over there with rifles in case it's needed. There are barricades on the sides of the streets here, just in case someone were to try anything. Um, there were sweeps with just countless numbers of officers that say police across the chest, so everyone is very clear, as if you couldn't tell from the bulletproof vests and the weapons, that they're here as a deterrent. And not, not to say that there's a vulnerability that someone would actually get hurt here, but according to one man, there's just so much fear after what happened. This community trying to rally and trying to grieve. And I asked several people I spoke with, including this man, Mr. Paskin, uh, about what it means to be in such a large group and the message that it sends at this hour. Take a listen to what he said. We need thousands of people. We need the world to hear that this isn't about territory. This isn't about politics. This isn't about any of that. This is about terrorism. It means that people still care. It means that we're human beings. It means that we have a heart. 
The gentleman that you just heard from, his daughter Hallie is in the IDF, one of the 300,000 or so people that was called up. As for Dari, the woman that we heard from afterwards, her entire family is Holocaust survivors. And she made a comment to me that it really does feel like this anti-Semitism is woven into the fabric of what we know and what we live to this day. She made the point that the reason there is the state of Israel in the modern sense is because six million Jews were murdered during the Holocaust. And here we are again, with all these people banding together to make a very clear point. They're not scared. They're not going to back down. This is going to be a direct confrontation with not an, just an ideology, but with sheer evil. Sam don't get any Brock, live for us in Miami with that powerful reporting. Sam, thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, controversial Congressman George Santos now getting hit with new charges late today. It's a 23-count indictment that alleges Santos stole the identities of campaign donors and then rung up tens of thousands of dollars on their credit cards. Prosecutors say some of that stolen money went straight to Santos' own bank account. The congressman has previously denied defrauding anybody. Number two, California officials say two deputies are badly hurt and in the hospital after a trailer caught fire at a mobile shooting range in L.A. Firefighters are still trying to get a handle on this thing. No word on what caused it. The shooting range is at a detention center, but officials say there's no threat to the inmates there. All mobile ranges across L.A. County are temporarily closed right now while the investigation continues. Number three, the state of Utah is suing TikTok, accusing the app of encouraging addictive and harmful habits on social media for kids. Utah now becomes the third state to file this kind of suit, claiming that TikTok deceived people by saying the app is safe for kids and that it misled users about Chinese parent company ByteDance's involvement in the company. TikTok telling the Associated Press it has industry-leading safeguards for young people. Number four, Republican Carrie Lake is set to announce she is running for Senate in Arizona. But that announcement is set to come just a few hours from now. The election is expected to be very competitive. Lake, of course, is an ally of former President Donald Trump and unsuccessfully ran for governor last year. She is an election denier, still hasn't conceded that she actually lost that race to Democrat Katie Hobbs. Number five, the former head of the FTX sister hedge fund is testifying against Sam Bankman Fried in his fraud trial today. Caroline Ellison is also SBF's ex-girlfriend. She says he directed her to defraud customers. She pleaded guilty to several charges last year, including wire fraud, money laundering. She's now cooperating with prosecutors. Sam Bankman-Fried has pleaded not guilty to all charges, but could face life in prison if convicted. When we come back, new concerns about a humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip, how the United Nations is trying to help the thousands of Palestinian civilians trapped there. Concern now growing of a potential humanitarian crisis looming with some 180,000 Palestinians in Gaza looking to try to find shelter in these U.N. facilities. It comes as the World Health Organization and the U.N. today are asking for this corridor, a humanitarian corridor to be established in and out of the Gaza Strip. Part of the problem, right, is that the borders, the border crossings are closed. You can't get in, you can't get out. You can see these trucks from Egypt trying to bring in food and fuel to Gaza, but they made a U-turn after the only crossing point between Egypt and the Gaza Strip was bombed and shuttered. Matt Bradley is joining us live now from the region. Matt, let me start there, right? This issue, and you've laid it out, I think, re repeatedly here with us on the air, the idea that the Israeli prime minister has said to people, civilians in Gaza, to get out, that is not so easy to do at this point. Yeah, and the fact is, is that we're seeing armies, a huge army. Now we're talking about 360,000 reservists who've been called up in addition to Israel's already standing regular army, which is extremely powerful, now mustering right on the border with the Gaza Strip, an enclave of 2.2 million people. Now remember, there were about 100,000 fighters, it sounds like, who uh, were maybe part of this. It's unclear how many were part of this. Most of the people in the Gaza Strip did not know that this invasion was going to be happening. We're not going to make a judgment call. We're not going to make some sort of moral claim about anybody there. But the fact is, is that we're about to see what looks like a massive operation go into an enclave that was already suffering from a 16-year-long blockade. And there were concerns that have been raised for the past decade and a half and that are now being raised urgently by the international community, particularly by the United Nations, the UN, uh, the UN agency that is in charge of dealing with humanitarian affairs in Gaza has already raised the alarm and now they're careful to parse their words, just as I am, 
not to make a judgment and not to diminish what Hamas has done in Israel. But they're raising alarms about the lack of electricity, the lack of medical care, about the continuing attacks that they say, 11 attacks now, on health care facilities uh, just since Saturday by the Israelis in the Gaza Strip. Now, they're warning of a further humanitarian crisis on top of the one that already existed there. And as you mentioned, that so many Israelis have been saying that Gazans should leave, particularly Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister. They have no place to go because this is a blockaded area. It's about twice the size of Washington, D.C., where you are now, but so much more uh, densely populated. So, excuse me, this is going to be a massive uh, humanitarian concern coming up in the coming days and probably for months and years to come. Hallie. You are there, Matt, uh, in Lebanon. Talk to me about what you're seeing on the ground where you are, as we've laid out already here on the show, the way that there is concern now that this could escalate into a broader regional conflict. Yeah, I mean, we're actually seeing it with our own eyes. We had front row seats for just the past most of the evening. If you look, it, you can't really see, but there's those lights over there yeah, right above that hill. We saw what looked like outgoing artillery. OK, good. We saw outgoing artillery uh, and we saw a fire that was burning there for a while. And we've seen some closer up images. This is small fries, small potatoes compared to what's happening on the border of the Gaza Strip, inside the Gaza Strip and in Israel. So far, six people have been killed, including a top Israeli official um, in these cross border fighting that we've been seeing artillery airstrikes. Very, very small fighting compared to what we've been seeing elsewhere. But in many ways, the fears here are more considerable, more substantial, because if Hezbollah, which is the main military force that uh, that is you know, occupying this area of southern Lebanon, if they enter the war, they have considerable firepower, probably even more than Hamas, because they're a political party. They have run of the country. They operate ports and airports. They can bring in weapons. They can come and go as they please, unlike Hamas. So and they have political support. So they are in a position to wreak a lot of havoc on northern Israel and the North and the Israelis are in a very good position to attack back. And that would put the people of Lebanon and the people of northern Israel in a very bad situation, more bloodletting on an already bloody situation. Hallie. Matt Bradley live for us there in Lebanon. Thank you so much. I want to bring in Andrea Mitchell now for more analysis on this. And Andrea, we're just getting to this new video now of Israeli tanks deploying to the border with Lebanon today, where we just heard from Matt Bradley. Talk about here the concern that this could um, essentially blow up beyond not just Israel, Gaza, but to other parts of the region here, because it seems like that is some of the focus for some of these officials that I know we're talking to. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the right question, because Secretary Blinken is now going tomorrow to the Middle East, to Israel and to Jordan. And that's partly to talk to not only Israel and make sure that they are all on the same page and they are on the same page with Netanyahu completely on security and on the response here in Gaza to this horrendous assault, unprecedented assault. But in addition to talk to others in the region and to go to Jordan, a key player, uh, the second Arab country to recognize Israel and to talk about not letting this spread further. And the other piece of that is the deployment of the USS Gerald Ford, the battle group, the car aircraft carrier battle group, uh, to the Eastern Mediterranean, not only to deter Iran uh, and its proxies, Hezbollah in Lebanon, from doing anything to spread this, but also to be available if it does spread to the northern you know, region, to a northern front, a second front from Hezbollah, which has 130,000 rockets, sophisticated rockets, far more sophisticated than what Hamas has, uh, aimed, targeted at Israel. If that were to happen, a major assault, uh, James Chavides told us earlier today that he thinks it would be very uh, immediately uh, responded to by fighter jets launching from that battleship, from that aircraft carrier, rather. So uh, that would bring the U.S. directly into confrontation with Lebanon, Hezbollah, right. but really with Iran. There's also this piece of it, Andrea, as we, as we cover now um, this war with Israel and Hamas. We've also, as you well know, have covered over the course of the last year and a half a different war, right? The war uh, in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of that country. There is now a potential link here because our team is reporting that the White House and some key lawmakers are looking at whether to link help to Ukraine, to, to Israel, to more funding for Ukraine. Jake Sullivan talked about this, the National Security Advisor. Let me play that. It is so much more cost effective to take the action now 
as opposed to pay the huge price later. We firmly reject the notion that the United States of America cannot at once support the freedom, freedom of loving people of Ukraine and support the state of Israel. Talk to us how we should be thinking about um, both of these issues, different parts of the world, obviously, but, but interconnected now in a way that, um, that is, is complicated but important. Well, one of the problems with resupplying Israel is that they also need money. They need money for parts, parts that cannot be supplied by the U.S. Mm -hmm. from our stockpiles. So they, they need to have the financing, and nothing can happen from the pipeline. No money can come from the pipeline. It has to come from an appropriation, a supplemental appropriation. And that can't happen without a Speaker of the House. So it's really a domino thing where the stalemate in Washington, unless it's resolved in the next 24, 48 hours, is really potentially going to hurt Israel. And by tying Israel to Ukraine, I think the White House feels they can pick up some support because there is more widespread support for Israel than there is for a supplemental for Ukraine. Andrea Mitchell, thank you so much for being with us here live from here in Washington. Thanks. To the other international stories we've been following today, because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of China, two American women and their Nepalese Sherpa guides have been declared dead after trying to climb one of the world's tallest mountains in Tibet. The Chinese government has suspended all activities on the mountain because of avalanches. They're reportedly not able to launch a search and rescue operation until next spring because of weather concerns. The women were trying to become the first American women to climb the 14 tallest peaks in the world. Out of Russia, officials in Moscow say coolant leaked in a Russian module on board the International Space Station, but that there's no risk to the crew. The Russian space agency says engineers tried to investigate what caused this. Several similar leaks have been blamed on tiny meteoroids. And out of the UK, researchers have used the gene editing technology CRISPR to make chickens more resistant to bird flu, according to a new study. Bird flu has been sweeping through chicken farms, poultry operations for the last couple of years, killing tens of millions of chickens around the world. Coming up here on the show, some brand new research into NBC News tonight about a coordinated disinformation campaign on X surrounding the war between Hamas and Israel. What the platform is doing about it next. Back to our top story of the night, of course, and that is the war between Israel and Hamas. New into NBC Tonight, a research group uncovering a network of dozens of accounts on X, formerly known as Twitter, spreading what's, spreading, rather, what's believed to be coordinated posts with disinformation about the war. Posts and videos that have been viewed millions of times. X started suspending some of the accounts after they were contacted by NBC News, but didn't otherwise have any comment. It's something we've seen a lot of over the past few days. Take this video saying Hamas militants started a new airstrike on Israel. You see that? That's, that, video, that is actually from a video game. That's not even real. You see the exact same video posted to YouTube here. Then there was this post claiming Israel bombed and destroyed an old Greek Orthodox church in Gaza. It has something like 3 million views. But the church itself said it hasn't been touched, that any other news is false. All of these posts now have disclaimers on the bottom if you go to X and look at the post, but they're not taken down. And some of them are posted from verified users, making it harder for people to know what's real. NBC News tech correspondent Jake Ward is joining us now. And Jake, there, these are just a couple of examples of this. These posts containing misinformation, disinformation, very difficult, especially at a moment like this, when people are, frankly, desperate for information, turning to social media platforms. It is not a clear-cut picture. It is not a clear-cut picture, Hallie. The past few days have just been this vivid lesson in the fact that you literally cannot trust what social media feeds you these days. Uh, and even more difficult is the surprise turn of events, which means that uh, legitimate sources of information are slow to react because they were taken just as surprised as, as so many people were across Israel. So a very, very difficult moment. But as you say, there's just this proliferation of, of misleading content. And when it's not just made up, as in the case of the video game clip you're uh, shown there, um, you know, it's it's out of context or out of time. This video of, of uh, an attack by Israeli forces on Gaza is in fact that, what it purports to be, but it's from May, not from 
this current set of attacks. And so you have things out of time like that. Not only that, you have whole presidential proclamations being concocted out of thin air. This, uh, uh, there's a, a piece of, of uh, Biden looking, legitimate looking Biden information uh, that looks to, that purports to say that $8 billion will be set aside for Israel. It's in fact a doctored copy of what you see there on the right, which is the 400 million that Biden put toward Ukrainian aid. You know, this is the kind of stuff that is coming fast and furious right now. And it's happening, of course, because social media is cutting back on the people who try to patrol this stuff. I mean, X, as you mentioned, is really the, the, the locus of so much of this stuff because they have cut back so many of their teams, their elections integrity team, their trust and safety teams, all of those have been scaled back. X has had no comment for us on this, um, but they have been cutting back, we know from many reports and many sources. And that's also true across social media. You have uh, Twitter, you have Meta, you have uh, all these different companies cutting back on the very people that we trust to try and keep this stuff uh, uh, as reliable as possible. And that has just made the fog of war all that much deeper right now, Hallie. You talk about the issue specifically as it relates to X, of course, old Twitter, basically. The EU, I mean, has put out this notice basically for Elon Musk to come and respond to X's role in the spread of some of this content, of this disinformation over there. That's right. Here in the United States, misinformation is considered a scourge, but it's not fundamentally illegal. In the EU, it's different. Under the Digital Services Act, uh, Thierry Breton, the commissioner, has sent Elon Musk this demand that he stop letting this stuff move around on the platform uh, and that he'll face consequences if it doesn't uh, stop immediately. He's given him 24 hours to do it. And so the EU really reminding us uh, that, again, you cannot trust what comes to you on the social media feed. Really, the only reliable thing that we can do at this point uh, Hallie, is try to go out and find reliable information. Do not trust what's coming to you yeah. in the passive way that social media is built to feed it to you. You have to go find reliable sources, especially in difficult times like this, Hallie. Jake Ward, thank you so much. When we come back, much more here on the show, including growing backlash over a group of Harvard students' letter was pro-Palestinian. What that university and others are saying about criticism on campus, plus another demonstration we're seeing in New York tonight. We're going to be live there. Stay with us. New protests tonight over Hamas's war with Israel. Take a look at Columbia University. Hundreds of students there wrapped in Israeli flags, praying, singing together. It comes as pro-Palestinian student groups at some top universities are putting out statements supporting the Hamas attack. Here's a statement signed by 35 pro-Palestinian organizations at Harvard. You may have read about this or seen this here. It says in part, I'm quoting, that they hold the Israeli regi regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence, adding these events did not occur in a vacuum. For the last two decades, millions of Palestinians in Gaza have been forced to live in an open-air prison. Now, you're seeing some prominent alumni of Harvard, like Republican lawmakers Senator Ted Cruz, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik hitting back, with Cruz posting on X, what the hell is wrong with Harvard? Stefanik calling the statement abhorrent and heinous. We've seen similar statements from pro-Palestinian groups at Stanford, at Yale, at Columbia. Stephen Romo is joining us now outside of Columbia in New York. Talk through what we're hearing about some of the, the response here and the way that this has become part of a domestic issue around what's happening with this war. Yeah, Hallie, there's been a lot of heated criticism about these statements we're getting, not only from schools themselves, but from just students and student organizations who attend these schools. And you mentioned that rally that happened earlier here tonight at Columbia. Students coming together uh, it didn't really seem like a rally. It was so somber, people crying and praying together. But we did get the opportunity to ask students what they think about Columbia's response. I saw a lot of very negative and hurtful uh, emails from presidents of university, from student unions. For Columbia's response, it was a very mixed review. It took the president, I believe, a couple of days to make a, an email commenting on it. Once she did, it seemed like a very positive email that, to the community. Now, it was a very different reaction from the students at Columbia who were supporting uh, people from uh, the Palestinian region at this time. They were saying that they were unhappy the faculty statements did not go far enough and defending uh, innocent Palestinians who may be injured or killed in the ongoing violence. They did not go as far, though, as the Harvard student groups that you mentioned earlier, those 35 groups blaming Israel 
for the terrorist attacks carried out by Hamas. Now, Harvard has been in the spotlight since those comments by the students group were made uh, over the weekend. University President Claudine Gay released a statement yesterday that some think did not go far enough in condemning Hamas and anti-Semitism in general. So she released a new statement today on that topic and on the topic of the student groups, saying in part, quote, let there be no doubt that I condemn the terrorist atrocities perpetrated by Hamas. While our students have the right to speak for themselves, no student group, not even 30 student groups, speak for Harvard University or its leadership. Now, former Harvard president Larry Summers also had a lot to say about what these students groups put out in that statement. This is an atrocity at an extraordinarily level. And yet, it has not been condemned. It's not complicated. It's not intellectual. It's not subtle. It is wrong. And that should be something that can be understood on our leading campuses. Now, it's, uh, of course, the controversy is not going to be over on campuses. In fact, we learned tonight the Harvard-Palestine Solidarity Group was planning to have a vigil tonight, but they say they had to cancel that due to some concerns for their safety tonight. So likely to see more of this going forward, Hallie. Stephen Romo, live for us there outside Columbia. Stephen, thank you so much. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.